People seem to have a love-hate relationship with the idea of the Sony ZV-E1, and the question is, why? On one hand, it's got the same sensor, the same amazing image quality, and the same, if not more, features than the A7S III and the FX3 for way less money. On the other hand, it is very stripped down, it's missing some of the professional features that some people might consider deal breakers, and it's still $2,200, which is not within the typical budget for a beginner. So, how do you know if the ZV-E1 is the right camera for you? Well, first, before you look at what's missing from this camera, you should look at the features that it does have. I would argue that this camera is great for more than just vloggers, but since that is the main intention of it, it does have a bunch of great vlogging-centric features. There's something called cinematic vlog mode, which automatically puts black bars at the top and bottom to try and give you a wider looking aspect ratio, and it forces the camera into 24 frames per second since that is the cinematic standard. The cinematic vlog mode also has a bunch of built-in looks so you can get a baked-in look in camera so you don't have to do so much color grading. There's product showcase mode that we've seen on some other Sony cameras cameras already so that if you're doing a review and you're holding up products closer to the camera than your face, it'll grab focus on that product instead of keeping with your face like it would in the normal face tracking mode. There's a one button background defocus mode so you can just click that and it'll automatically adjust the settings of the camera to give you that nice blurry background. So right now I'm in an auto mode and you can see that it's at f11 so it's choosing the aperture for me but if I hit that background defocus mode it's going to change the settings so that it can get that aperture down to a lower number or a wider aperture so that we can get that blurry background. And if I hit it again it'll actually go into clear background mode which means it's going to be a higher aperture number or a narrower aperture so that we can see everything in focus. And it also has a new multiple face recognition so that if somebody else comes into your frame, it'll automatically adjust the aperture to make sure that everybody in the shot is in focus. If you're someone who has more experience with cameras and you want more control over your cameras, you might think that these are kind of gimmicky or unnecessary, but I think that's why we don't see these features put into Sony's more professional cameras. However, if you're someone with less camera experience or maybe you just want to focus more on the content that you're making instead of how you're making it, then I can totally see how some of these vlogging features would make life easier. The other thing that this camera has that we've only seen on one other Sony camera so far is the separate AI processor, and this opens up a whole host of features that we don't have on other Sony cameras. For example, the autofocus on this camera is right on par with the Sony a7R5. It has the ability to detect the shape of a human body so it can focus on the body, the head, or the eyes and even if some of that is obscured it can still find those parts because it knows the whole shape. So unlike previous cameras you can be turned away from the camera or you can be wearing sunglasses or a mask and it should still be able to find where your face is and even if it can't it'll try and focus on your body. We've also got all of the available autofocus subject tracking modes for human, birds and animals, birds or animals individually, insects, cars and trains, and airplanes. But on top of all the autofocus features we're also able to use that that new subject recognition with things like the framing stabilizer. This feature uses a significant crop to be able to hold the framing of whatever subject you want, either in the center of the frame or wherever you manually choose to put that subject. For example, in this shot, I was just using the app to tap on either the bush behind me or on myself. It would not only focus on that area, but also move where the center of the frame was. Similarly, there's a feature called auto framing that mimics having an actual camera person who zooms in on the subject to the desired amount and then follows them around in the frame. I used this feature a bunch on the video that I made about the FX3 firmware update because I was trying to go for that kind of mockumentary look and I was really impressed with how natural it looked, how much it looked like there was actually a person holding the camera. But I assure you, it was just me out there. I can see this being immensely helpful for getting behind the scenes footage without having to hire an extra person to come out and film. You just have to make sure that you're shooting everything wide enough because you need a lot of room for it to move around. And if you really want, you can use the HDMI output to get a clean signal without the crop so you can have the full wide shot as well. On top of the framing stabilizer and auto framing function, we've also got a new stabilization.
stabilization mode that's called active dynamic stabilization. So now we've got the standard, which is just the in-body stabilization on the sensor. We've got the active, and if we go one more level up, we've got active dynamic, which takes a significant crop, but it does such a crazy job. That being said, again, you have to make sure that you're filming wide enough because all of these functions that are auto framing or stabilizing, they do have a significant crop. So you wanna make sure you leave enough room for that. One of my favorite features that utilizes the AI functionality of this camera is the new microphone. We've got a three capsule microphone that is able to pick up in front of the camera, behind the camera, or all around the camera, depending on what setting you have it on. And if you put it into auto mode, it will automatically detect what's in the scene and make that decision for you. And it comes with a little fuzzy windscreen that makes it look like a troll doll as well. Okay, so I've got the microphone set in auto mode. It should be picking up what's happening in front of the camera because it sees my face and it knows that I'm probably talking. But if I were to flip the camera around, Maybe I wanted to show you these flowers here and talk about them a little bit. It should have switched over to from behind the camera, so the microphone is picking up from back here so that I can talk to you. And if I switch it back around, once it sees that my face is in frame, it should also switch that microphone around. You can probably hear somebody's doing their lawn across the way. Physically, the ZV-E1 is smaller and lighter than even the FX3, and I will get to the limitations of that in a bit, but it does make it easier to pack, it makes it easier to carry around, and it actually has great controls as well. Now, I know that might seem counterintuitive because we've got less buttons and dials than we have on some of the higher-end Sony cameras, but they've given us a brand new user-friendly touchscreen experience on this camera that we've never seen on any Sony camera before. Now we've got functions that we can access on either side of the monitor by swiping them in or out if we wanna get rid of them, and you can choose whether they both come in at the same time or whether they're individual. Let's say you use one side of the functions more than the other, and if we swipe up from the bottom, we can easily get to our function menu now. And finally, we can control our exposure and white balance settings using the touchscreen. This is something that I've been wanting forever. So when you add all of this new touchscreen functionality up, it makes it much more reasonable to have a few less custom buttons or dials or what have you. And even though we have a smaller body on this camera, we're still using the FZ100 batteries that we see on all the other Sony full-frame cameras, so we still have great battery life. One thing that I've seen some other reviews claim is that the ZV-E1 doesn't have any kind of weather sealing, but on the Sony website itself, it definitely says that this camera has dust and moisture resistance, which is the same thing that Sony says about all their other weather sealed cameras. So it definitely has something, nothing to worry about there. And the Sony ZV-E1 is the first camera in the Sony lineup that's able to do 4K streaming over USB-C. I've been using this a lot with my Sony a7 IV, but you can only do it in 1080. So now we've got an even higher quality for live streams and for your Zoom meetings if you wanna look super high definition. Now, of course, if your main concern is image quality, you've got nothing to worry about here. We've got the same full frame 12.1 megapixel low light beast sensor that we see on the FX3 and the A7S III. It's got the same dual base ISOs. It shoots the same frame rates, the same codecs. It's full 10 bit. And we've got the ability to load LUTs on the camera just like the recent firmware updates on the FX3. So you can expect the exact same image quality that we get out of those other cameras, except the catch here is that the FX3 and A7S3 are 3,900 and 3,500 US dollars respectively, whereas this camera is only $2,200. So you save so much money for that same image quality. So obviously that seems like a great deal comparatively, but before you go running out to the store to buy it, there are some downsides that might change your mind. I love how small and light the ZV-E1 is for running around with, but you definitely notice right off the bat that it doesn't feel like it's made with that same robust quality that other Sony cameras are. It's definitely a little bit more plasticky feeling, and I feel like I have to be a little bit more careful with it when I'm handling it. If you pair this camera with a smaller lens, something like the 16 to 35 F4 from Sony, it feels pretty good. But if you're like me and you like to use the big G Master lenses from Sony, the balance definitely feels like it's tipping forward and 
because the grip isn't as hefty on this camera, it doesn't feel as comfortable to hold. One of the big deal breakers that I've heard from some more professional users is the fact that the ZV-E1 only has one SD card slot, so there's no option for simultaneous recording so that you have a backup in case you have a card failure. We're also missing the full-size HDMI port that we've been seeing on more recent Sony cameras, and they've gone back to the micro HDMI that we saw previously, which still technically transmits the same signal, but it's more flimsy and more breakable. You have to be a little bit more careful with it. And as I'm sure you've noticed, we've got no electronic viewfinder on this camera, just like the FX3, which keeps the size down, and that's great, but it's really hard to see when you're out in bright daylight. And speaking of being outside in bright sunlight, this camera has no cooling mechanisms like we see on the A7S III or FX3. So that being said, I'd like to say that my experience has been that there's no problem with overheating, and from what I've seen in other reviews, it's mostly when you're shooting for long periods of time at high frame rates in high heat situations. So if your shooting style or whatever it is that you're shooting doesn't meet that specific criteria, you should be fine. So why is there this love-hate relationship with the Sony ZV-E1? I think it's honestly because it's kind of a confusing camera. Technically, this camera is made for content creators, vloggers, people who previously we would have thought of as beginners, not the kind of camera nerds and professionals who want the fully manual control of the FX3. But because it has the same sensor as the FX3, same image quality, and it has that AI processor from the A7R5, it kind of outpaces a lot of the other Sony cameras in their lineup. So all of a sudden, someone who's been interested in the image quality of the Sony a7S III or FX3 has a way cheaper option to get that same quality, but they've been staring at the B&H page for the FX3 for a month now, and they're hooked on those professional features that it has, and they're kind of disappointed that this one doesn't have them. This is now the least expensive Sony option for content creators and vloggers to be able to get full frame 10-bit video and to try and match the quality that we see from other creators who are maybe a little bit nerdy about their cameras. That being said, that kind of creator might not know what 10-bit is or how to color grade or how to really leverage all of the power that this camera actually gives. And $2,200 is not a typical beginner budget for a camera. So really, while I personally think this is a fantastic camera, it's kind of hard to say who it's exactly for, but I'm gonna try anyway. If you already own another Sony camera with 10-bit video and you're looking for a really good B cam at a lower price, this may be a good option. If you're a content creator or vlogger that liked some of the functions or ease of use features that I mentioned in this video, this camera may be a good option. If you're a more hybrid video and photo shooter and you want a camera that's better at doing both, maybe take a look at the a7 IV instead. And if any of the things that I listed as drawbacks would drive you crazy while trying to use this camera, maybe just keep saving up for the a7S III or FX3. Leave a comment down below and let me know what you think of the Sony ZV-E1. I'll just be out here trying to enjoy the little bit of sunshine I've got left.